Hello, uh, so this is unit three, immunology and neurobiology, and we're in the immunology section. This is KRA 7, we are almost done, almost done of the horrible higher human course. I'm joking, of course, it's fantastic and I love it. I totally love it. Okay, uh, so we're on to immunization. This is the first section, this is about vaccines. Second section is gonna be about vaccine program. Okay, so vaccination. The immune system can be artificially activated by the use of vaccines. So if we're thinking back to what we previously learned about the specific immune response, essentially vaccines activate that so that we get that nice, very fast second antibody response uh, to uh, infection coming in. This means that person won't get ill, maybe the effects of the illness will be reduced, that kind of thing. So what happens is the vaccine trains the immune system to recognize infections and react quickly to them before they cause a serious problem. Okay, so what is a vaccine? A vaccine, well, you should know that by now because of the way that we're living in the world and that most of you are, will be getting one pretty soon. But it's basically when you take um, a kind of inactive or a dead version of the disease and that's usually what's injected into you. So uh, you can see the list here. Um, these are potential forms of the antigen that a vaccine can contain. So it could be dead pathogen, so properly dead one, an activated one, so ones that are no longer actually actively dangerous, slightly disabled ones, or just a weakened version of it. So it could be any versions of these, anything of the actual vaccine, so the thing that is dangerous. So if you take COVID, for instance, it would be a dead or an inactive version of COVID that you would actually get in your vaccine. That would be the thing that is injected into you to allow your body to learn how to tackle the proper bad COVID. Okay, uh, vaccines also get mixed with, and this is an important term you need to know for hire, is an adjuvant. Now, adjuvants boost the effect of the vaccine. Okay, they can make the vaccine more expensive and adjuvants are often the things that anti-vaxxers have problems with. Like um, they might be these certain chemicals that are added in and an anti-vaxxer person might look at it and go, why are you putting that chemical in? And the reason is because it will make the vaccine more effective. Um, so you can see from the diagram there, you can have just the actual vaccine molecule in a human cell and you might not get an immune response, whereas you add the adjuvant and there you're actually getting the immune response and the reaction. So why are vaccines important? Obviously they are important because they prevent lots of us from getting a disease. Like you get a vaccination, it means the chance of you being able to get that disease are very, very low. It doesn't make it impossible that like you can have had a vaccine and you can still get a disease, but the chance of you getting it are then considerably lower. And then another reason that are really important is there are lots of people in society who can't get these. So very, very young babies can't get them. Very old people, anyone with any kind of health condition, they might not be able to get a vaccine. If they can't get a vaccine and they come into contact with it, that is bad because that will probably then kill them. But if everyone else in the world is a vaccine, that means everyone else in the world is very unlikely to have that disease. So it means if a baby or an old person or someone with a health condition does come into contact with someone, the likelihood of the person that they're coming into contact with having that disease is going to be so much less if everyone else is vaccinated. So it's important that everyone who can really get a vaccine gets one because then we're protecting the young and the old and anyone else who can't really fight for themselves. Okay, now this leads us into the idea of herd immunity. And again, you might have heard that term bandied around in the news. Herd immunity is when enough of the population have been immunized against an infection to protect the whole population. So not everybody will be immune, but enough people that means that the contagious disease cannot spread, that the virus or bacteria, whatever infection, can't spread throughout the population because basically immune people are acting like a wall, a barrier. Now, herd immunity is an important definition you need to know, as is the herd immunity threshold, which is a slightly different thing. Threshold is basically the number of people that need to be vaccinated for herd immunity to actually be a thing. So there are so many people that need to actually have had a vaccine and become immune to it before we can say that herd immunity is going to become a thing. And this depends on a couple of different factors, such as the type of infection, so how dangerous it could be, the effectiveness of the vaccine, like you again you'll have heard about COVID, as some of the vaccines are more um, effective than the other, they have a higher percentage of immunity, so things like that, and also the density of the population, so how many people there actually is. If there's a lot of people, you're going to need a lot of immunity to actually get to the point you have herd immunity. Yeah, to give you some ideas, uh, on this next slide what we've got, we've got Oh no, sorry, not this one. 
I'm going to skip that one just now. Okay, um, what we've got on this next slide is the idea of the R number. Now, we've been looking at the R number again a lot when it comes to COVID. All diseases have different R numbers. So, for example, I'm going to pick on measles down the bottom there. You might have heard of measles. Hopefully you have had your MMR jab or measles vaccination to be protected from it because you can see that the herd immunity threshold for measles is really high. It means 83 and 94 percent or between that number have to be vaccinated or immune for measles not to spread in our population. Now, we had that in about the mid 90s or so. Um, and there's an example we'll go through with Andrew Wakefield. Um, and we're going to look at basically what he did to break the, the measles uh, herd immunity threshold. Um, but you can see different diseases like mumps has got a fairly uh, kind of high again mm -hmm. threshold there. It's fairly um, spreading. Looking at the R number, the R number is for every infected person, how many people do they pass that infection on to? OK, so for mumps, it says one person with mumps, they are going to spread that to between four and seven people. Uh, for measles, you can see how contagious that is. One person who has measles can pass it to 12 to 18 people. And that shows that it's an incredibly contagious disease there. And so it's got a higher herd immunity threshold because of how quickly that disease spreads through the population. OK, so to summarise the key things that you need to know from this video, the first thing, what is the actual contents of a vaccine? It could be any dead pathogens, it could be an inactivated pathogen, it could be a disabled pathogen, or it could be a weakened pathogen. Okay, an adjuvant is a substance that boots, boosts the efficacy of a vaccine, so how well it works. Herd immunity is when there are enough people in a society that are vaccinated or immune to the disease so it won't spread. And herd immunity threshold is the number of people that need to be immune or vaccinated in order to get herd immunity to happen. OK, so that's it in terms of just basic bore bones of vaccines. The next slide, the next slide, the next uh, PowerPoint is all about uh, vaccination programs. I had it there and it slipped away. I don't know why. Uh, see you then.